I hope is interesting to you, but to me, it's personal because it's about my family. Uh, the story is focused in Washington County, but I've included several things about Sarpy County along the way. Um, my story of uh, the Missouri River Trading Post uh, in Nathan's Lake will describe my adventure to find the lake and it really allowed me to get in touch with my ancestors. And like you, we are so proud of what our ancestors have done for us. So let's start with the Missouri River Trading Post. Um, we're encouraged to respect and honor our ancestors. Um, this is the story about my ancestor, Jonathan Mendez Nathan, and I'm gonna call him Mendez in this presentation, and my dad's uncle Samuel Nathan and his wife Leah. Uh, and I had some pictures, but I really wanted to learn more about my family. And what I found is that they deserve to be remembered. And through research, uh, I found that they were real people. Um, I had a better idea who I am. And I learned how they lived by going to the places where they lived. And I hope that, uh, uh, and in a way, it, it put their life back together. And I hope this presentation will motivate you to get in touch with your ancestors by doing some genealogy research. And uh, I'm sure Ben would mind me saying that the Sarpy County Museum can really help you along the way. Um, and before I start, uh, I wanted to give a big shout out to some new family members that I just met uh, just a week or two ago. Uh, Hello to the Dorn family in Washington State. Um, and just the other day, I got an email from, picture this, the great granddaughter of Samuel Nathan, the one I'm gonna talk about. I had never met them before. Um, and with joy, uh, we've had more fun sharing uh, pictures and stories. And uh, you'll even see in this presentation, some of their pictures. I was determined to find this lovely place uh, of what Nathan's Lake, and I really wanted to almost touch the same place that Mendez was at at his trading post. So my story begins, I was going through my dad's belongings a couple years ago, and I found a newspaper article. And it was about Nathan's Lake, a couple pages long, and it was just amazing. It was just filled with information about my family that I knew nothing about. Um, next, I went to uh, obtain some pictures uh, from the family. I went to some historical societies. Um, and I, I found some things on the internet that, that I'll describe for you. Um, now, along the way, and you'll experience this too as you do research, you get to meet new people. So I just wanted to mention uh, Julie Ashton and Faith Norwood from the Washington County Historical Museum in Fort Calhoun. Uh, I met them, showed them some pictures, and they said, we want you to give us a talk. And I said, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, we want stories. So that's what got me really involved in this research. I wanted to find the deed of Nathan's Lake. So I went to the Register of Deeds in Washington County in Blair. And along the way, I met uh, Rob Bozell. Uh, Rob's our state archeologist. I met Walt Duda. Uh, his family actually owned the land where uh, Mendez traded beaver skins at Jean-Pierre Cabernet's trading post. And recently I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, with Ben. So even though I had pictures, um, I was uh, interested in the stories. And one thing I did was I, I had my library card and I searched for Nathan's Lake and Sarpy County uh, trading posts. And I found 350 items. 
Um, and it was really a lot of fun to read these. So I found this information and I uh, put it together into this PowerPoint. So here's the article that I found. It was written in 1978 and it was called Omaha Jews Gather at Nathan's Lake. Now, Leonard Nathan is my dad's cousin, just to give you a perspective. So let me read you just a paragraph of this article and I want you to focus on the words in red because that's the basis of my presentation. As a child, Samuel uh, had been intrigued by stories of the Council Bluffs, the name given by Lewis and Clark to the Nebraska side of the Missouri. Mendez of New Orleans had been a partner with Jean-Pierre Cabernet in, at the post of the Otos, located in the hills overlooking the river just north of what is now now, or I'm sorry, uh, Hummel Park. In the early years of the 19th century, the valley had been rich in beaver, otter, and other fur-bearing animals, and it was while carrying pelts to the fun fair in Canton that in 1820, Mendez was lost at sea. At sea. So to set the scene, let's Think of the Missouri River just filled with nothing but beavers. Um, and uh, remember that uh, Mendez was, was trapping these and unfortunately he was lost at sea. Um, and you can see uh, from this exhibit, they would carry these pelts to Europe. And over in the right hand corner, you see the Stetson hat. That was one thing that they made out of the beaver skins. So to have more uh, pelts, uh, what Mendez learned was that he could trade with the uh, Native American Indians. And uh, the trappers would exchange beads um, for, uh, I just want to get my pointer out. Um, they would exchange these beads. Now they were different colors. Uh, and they had different names. Now, first of all, there's the white ones. These are the white beads. Uh, they're also called pound beads. And this red one over here, those are called white hearts. And the red on the outside. But what they liked the most were the blue ones, these padre beads, and they symbolize the sky and the water. And uh, the uh, Native Americans would trade 12 to 15 beaver skins for one of these beads. Now, Omaha and Bellevue is a, really an ideal location for forts and uh, trading posts because it was halfway between St. Louis and the upper uh, Missouri, and there were several Indian tribes in the area. Now these uh, trading posts were uh, sometimes they're called forts, sometimes they're posts, sometimes they're houses. So if you can picture west of the Mississippi, there was like 150 of these. And we're fortunate that we had like about 20 of them on the Missouri River. And these uh, posts were used for trade, but they also served as protection and uh, in the Omaha area, you'll have names like Lisa, Rivadu, Cabernet, and then as we move into Sarpy County, Sarpy and Fontenelle. Um, the trading uh, post business was very uh, competitive. There was a lot of money to be made in furs. Uh, and some of the names of these companies were the American Fur, the French, the Missouri fur in the Western. Now picture uh, St. Louis in 1821. There was like $2 million of commerce in St. Louis and 600,000 of that was from the fur trading business. Okay, next I wanna show you uh, A, uh, the location of these uh, trading posts. So here's 680 
and here's the Missouri River. And along the Missouri River, uh, you'll see the Mormon Bridge. So you can just kind of have a perspective. Now, prior to the Mormon Bridge, there's the Winter's Quar Quarter in, in Florence. It's called the Mill. Um, and then here's Cabernet's Trading Post right there. And then going up the river a little bit further, we see Fort Lisa. And then up the river, again on the Nebraska side, is the Council Bluffs, just before you get to Fort Atkinson. So for me to find out where the post of the Otos was, I decided to start to do some research about the Oto Indians. And here is a Nebraska historical marker. It's in Utah. And uh, in the second paragraph, it talks about Lewis and Clark having a council meeting, or they were just meeting with the, with the Indians, uh, and they did it at a place called the Council Bluffs. So here's a map uh, by uh, James McKay, and he actually built the post of the Otos right down here. And uh, McKay was a Scotsman and he led expeditions up the Missouri River. Um, and he was trading with the Oto Indians and these maps were eventually given to Lewis and Clark. But in my opinion, this wasn't the post of the Otos that Mendez was at because it wasn't next to Hummel Park. So when Lewis and Clark uh, did their expedition in 1804, they met with the various Indian tribes. One of them was the Otos. And when they got there, uh, the tribe was on their annual buffalo hunt. Um, but they were ready to talk to them. Uh, they had their speeches ready and they had gifts for the Indians. Um, and uh, in their speech, they said the U.S. had sovereignty and the great father of the 17 nations of America had the Indians' best interest. Now, they, there really wasn't a drawing or a painting of this council meeting, but there, there is this one in 1819, and it was done by uh, Stephen, uh, Major Stephen Long, and here's, here's Major Long uh, right in the middle. And he's talking, first of all, to some explorers. One of them was John Doherty. And that name may, may ring a bell to you Serpy uh, Museum members because he eventually became the owner of the Indian Trade Post. Uh, so they met with Chief Hardhart. And as you go off to the right, we can see Manuel uh, Lisa and his son. And then the little girl out here, Nakomi, she eventually became the wife of Peter Serpy. Now, Mendez, picture him, he's on, he's on the river trapping these beavers, and I'm convinced that he was somewhere in this picture too, because he was alive then. Joseph Ribadu um, had a post that it was called the Oto Trading Post. It was also known as the Oto Outfit uh, because it traded with the Otos. Um, and in 1823, he sold this post to Jean-Pierre Cabernet. Now, because Mendez passed away in uh, 1820, uh, I'm assuming that uh, Mendez was buddy-buddy with uh, uh, with Jean-Pierre. Um, now, I do have some evidence that uh, they had a close relationship, Mendez and Jean-Pierre, and Mendez wrote a very poignant letter of condolence when Cabernet lost one of his daughters, and this letter is at the Missouri Historical Society. So then Cabernet bought this or took over this uh, Ribadu post. Now here's a drawing of what that uh, post looked like. Um, and according to a Fort Calhoun newspaper, there's, there's a row of houses. 
there was a store building. There was a place where the their Indian wives could stay. They grew corn. And here you can see the Missouri River. Now it turns out that Peter Sarpy's brother's father-in-law was Jean-Pierre Cabernet. And uh, Peter Sarpy was a clerk at this trading post. So one day I uh, reached out to this gentleman, his name is Walt Duda, and his family owns the land where Cabernet Trading Post is at. And if you go up to Hummel Park, just go a little north by Ponca and North Road, you'll see a marker and it says Jean-Pierre Cabernet's Trading Post, 385 feet. So Walt, uh, Walt picked me up and we met uh, Linda Meggs from the Florence Mill that I mentioned earlier, and we took a drive and we stopped. And so Walt says, right there is Mendez Trading Post or is the Cabernet's Trading Post. And I literally sprinted out of my car because now I can be at the same spot with Mendez. And I was so excited until Linda says, I wouldn't go too far in there because there's poison ivy. And so here I was in my shorts and I, I guess I had to retreat a little bit, but I just want you to know how exciting it was to be at the spot of my uh, ancestor. Um, a paint, painter by the name of George Catlin, uh, he did a lot of paintings of, in, of Nebraska Indians, and he really showed the, uh, the fertility as well as the beauty of Nebraska. He painted 48 different Indian tribes and over 500 paintings. Uh, his paintings are in Washington, D.C. at the uh, uh, National Museum, and there's a Catlin North American Gallery. So why am I showing you this painting? Well, that's because this little white spot is Cabernet's trading post. You can see the Missouri River and you see the bluffs. Okay, so let's move on to Sarpy County and uh, uh, ben gave me this uh, beautiful colored postcard, um, and um, it's, uh, I want to start off by saying the roots of Bellevue lie deep in the Fontenelle Forest, and uh, this postcard is taken from a uh, painting by Carl Bodmer, and uh, one day, if you can picture this, they're in Fontenelle Forest, uh, and a ranger by the name of Gary Garibrandt and the former director of the Sarpy County Museum, his name was Ed Sturvis, and they're just kind of walking around and they notice some artifacts. And uh, through some later archeological digging that, that was done, they could almost match the foundation of the building to this painting. There were literally uh, hundreds of artifacts, clothes and pottery. Um, and then uh, this trading post later became, uh, was sold to the U.S. Office of Indian Affairs uh, headquarters of the Upper Missouri, where Agent John Doherty was the agent in charge. But it was really a beautiful building. Um, and Roosland uh, Fontenelle says, what a pretty house for the country. So I think he was really proud of it. So in 1833, uh, an explorer by the name of Prince Maximilian travels up the Missouri River. And in his uh, diaries that are at the Jocelyn Museum, um, you can see that he stopped at the Fontenelle Trading Post and the Cabernet Trading Post. Um, and uh, Addison Sheldon wrote a book called The History and Stories of Nebraska. And in that book, he says, Nebraska owes a great deal to the prince. He made our country and its people known to Europe. So Maximilian travels up the river. They spent a night at the uh, Cabernet Trading Post. 
and he was in the balcony and it must have been a wonderfully beautiful evening. And uh, as Addison Sheldon wrote, the proud Missouri glistened with the splendor and the glory of a full moon. It was a scene to be remembered. So as I did some research, I, uh, I found an article in 1910 about the Mason gavels. So I talked to Ben about this. And uh, the Masonic Lodge number one uh, was really at the uh, Peter Sarpy's post. Um, and these gavels were uh, uh, souvenirs and they were made out of the timber around the uh, training post. And this is a uh, exhibit that Ben showed me that you have at, at your museum. And I think it's cool because it's got Peter Sarpy and Fontenelle and, and a gavel. Another article I found was in 1930 and I'm calling this slide the historic dream team. So, so this, these were members of the Nebraska Historical Society, the Sarpy County, and they were examining some historic logs. And the question was, were these logs part of Sarpy County Trading Post? And they concluded that they were. Um, you might notice there's a lady here, Mrs. Miller. She was one of the remaining uh, pioneers. And I think that's kind of cool how the uh, all the historians in Sarpy County got together. So let's move 100 years later, and now we're going to talk about Nathan's Lake. So where's Nathan's Lake? So here's another map. You can see the uh, Missouri River. There's Iowa on the east and Nebraska on the west. And you go six miles north of Florence or three and a half miles from Fort Calhoun. And there's Nathan's Lake. Uh, it's connected by this creek called Deer Creek. This is a picture of the lake in um, 2003. And you'll notice all the birds are uh, there before they migrated. And while I was uh, going to the uh, Nebraska State Historical Society, I found an article and I'm gonna play you, uh, oops, it's not letting me play. Um, but anyhow, it was the story of, uh, of Nathan's Lake. Ira, if I could just interject, you might have to turn off the pointer and click the uh, mouse. And then well, there it is. Like, but I was only me. There we go. Merely contemplating the past, the dead past, gone beyond recall. Memories only now, as if yesterday. I remember my first trip to Nathan's Lake years ago. We went out in grand style. Oh, shoot. I'm trying to make, make the sound a little louder, sorry. Published in the Omaha World Herald on August 9th, 1931. But I was only musing, merely contemplating the past, the dead past, gone beyond recall. Memories only now, as if yesterday. I remember my first trip to Nathan's Lake years ago. We went out in grand style one Saturday night, father holding the reins on the big bone colt, buggy crammed with food for man and bait for fish. Then there came a break of several years. My next trip was with a sterner weapon, my first shotgun. And for the past six years, I have missed scarcely a day at this ducking paradise during the season. And now it is gone where mallards once were wont to preen and swish their tails in playful glee. There is rank grass. As far as the eye can see, there is grass. Only a tiny spot of water, little larger than the family bathtub, remains. 
and thus passes another old landmark. Omahans by the hundreds cherish memories of this lake and what it once offered lovers of outdoor sport. Many years ago, its waters teemed with game fish of all descriptions. And in the fall, right on the river as it was, ducks by the thousands tarried there en route to their winter homes. So next, I'm going to tell you my story to find the lake. Uh, I uh, had the uh, using Google Maps, I knew the longitude and the latitude and, you know, how you pro, 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 program your iPhone to go find something. And so here's my son, Andy, and I, and we're going off on a Sunday drive. This is in the summer of 2019. So we get within a mile of this lake and they, we ran into a road close sign. Now that's when the Missouri River had flooded. Um, so if you can imagine the disappointment that I had, I got within a mile of seeing this lovely place and I still didn't make it there. So the next day I met with the museum people in Washington County um, and after our meeting I had lunch at the Rustic Cafe which is right across the street. After lunch, I come out and here's a sheriff and a couple deputies. So I went up to them and I said, hey, my name's Nathan. I just want to go see Nathan's Lake. Uh, can you help me out? And this deputy looks at me and he says, hey, follow me. So we, uh, we went on a drive. We went through the road close signs and I got my first view of Nathan's Lake. Um, a few weeks later, I met up with uh, uh, two of the most uh, or nicest people that, that I've ever met, uh, Nancy and Richard Teets. Um, and they uh, were uh, farmers and um, we spent time together. Uh, I think I spent an hour showing uh, Nancy and Richard all my pictures. And then Richard said, uh, why don't you come for a ride? And so we jumped into his uh, his pickup truck and he took me for a ride to the lake. And we'll show you a picture later of the picture he took. But before I leave the teats, I want you to know that Nancy makes the best chocolate chip cookies. So Leonard wrote, as a young soldier at Fort Omaha, the days prior to the Spanish-American War, Samuel would frequently take his troops on hikes north of Florence along the Missouri River. It was a region he fondly remembered from his boyhood, and he was not only devoted to its beauty, but immersed in the rich history. He was determined that someday he would make this his home among those high bluffs and lovely lakes, and that uh, that had been left behind when the turbulent Missouri had changed its course. So Samuel was a military guy um, and he fought in the Spanish-American War. I went to Fort Omaha and I was actually able to see that he was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. Uh, he, he was a scholarly man, very reserved. He just wanted to be out in the country. He was not a city guy. Um, I think he'd rather ride a horse than drive a car. Uh, he was a member of the Grand Masonic Lodge, but most importantly, he brought his bride Leah to the lake in 1909. So uh, Leah, uh, her official name is Lena, but she went by Leah and her maiden name was Applebaum. She was born in New York she moved to Chicago and she became involved in some settlement movements. Um, her, professionally, she was a newspaper writer. She went under the name of Winnie Wise and uh, she wrote for the B News and the Omaha World Herald. Now with some ladies, they formed the chapter of the National Girl Scouts in the area and it was called Wagon Wheels and they did this in 1926. Uh, she was president of the Council of Jewish Women. 
Um, she was very active in the Red Cross as a volunteer. And because she lived in rural Nebraska, she learned how to shoot a gun. And so Sam was teaching her how to shoot a gun. She got to be really pretty good at it. And one story I read was the Kelly gang was on their property and they didn't want them there. So, she, so Leah started shooting her gun and, and they started and they ran off. And then she was a camp mother. She made a very good chicken dish. So here's a picture of Nathan's Lake. Um, and you can see the entrance. Uh, and the entrance was made out of willow wood. There's a lot of willow trees in the area. And as you drive through the entrance, you can see some of the buildings there. Well, in 1913, Nebraska had the worst tornado we've ever had. Uh, it was so deadly, it killed 94 people and it destroyed the, uh, this beautiful entrance, unfortunately. So if you drive through the entrance, this is what it looks like. Uh, there are eight cottages. There was a large dining room uh, and there was an ice house. Okay, uh, this is a picture of the lake. And first thing I want you to notice is how, uh, I just want to get my pointer, um, how, how wooded it was. There were lots of large trees there. Now, can you see over here, you see the boat? And then as we move up a little further, you see a Model T car. And then as you move a little further, can you see an American flag and some tents? Well, that was the campground for Camp Morris Levy. So here's Leonard on the hood of this Model T car. And on the left side, there's Leah. And on the right is Leonard's sister, Janet. Like I said, I went to uh, Blair to the County of Deeds and uh, uh, I was able to find uh, this uh, particular deed. Now, uh, Samuel had two sections of land. One was 21 and one was 22. This is section 21. And uh, combined 21 and 22 sections were 320 acres. He paid $4,750 for section 21. Now the Nathan family, uh, they liked to spend time at the lake uh, and they had some really good times. This was a family reunion in 1912. And uh, I just will point out here's uh, Samuel with uh, their daughter, Jana. And then this gentleman here is my grandfather. This is Isabel. This is who I am named after. And all the boats were named after the ladies. You see Louise and, 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 and Lenny. Uh, and uh, they were really dressed up for this family reunion with ties and white shirts. So here's another picture of the Nathans. Um, you can see Samuel and Leah with Janet and Leonard right in the foreground. Um, notice how big the lake is. In 1918, Fort Omaha had the uh, balloon school and there they were training um, for hot air balloons and dirigibles and learning the new technology. Um, and this picture on the left are some soldiers that were uh, actually stationed at the lake. And then they had a picnic in the right picture. Now Leonard wrote that as a young boy, he was just petrified that they were, because uh, he could hear the machine gun fire as they were practicing. Um, the uh, balloon school was actually located at the Florence Field, where the bank is today. Um, this is probably one of my favorite pictures. Here you can see Leah on the left, and she's teaching English to immigrants during World War I. Anyhow, I think that's really cool. And this picture was downtown. 
Okay, next, I uh, was given a plot map and I was able to find the uh, uh, section 21. And uh, on the map, it said uh, Samuel and wife Lena with children Janet and Leonard. There's their address. Uh, there's that 320 acres of land. And then over here on the map, we can now see where it says Nathan's Resort. And when I talked to Rob Bozell, he pointed out those little dots that you see there. Those were the buildings that I showed you earlier. So the, the lake became a uh, center of active social life. And let me kind of give you some examples, some stories about that. They had dances there. Now these were uh, dances with orchestras and they were also fundraisers. So uh, the money that they collected uh, went to uh, Fort Omaha for surgical dressings. And their organization, the ladies decided to call it Kill the Kaiser. This was in 1918. Um, the lake was really best known throughout the whole state of Nebraska for its fishing. Uh, in 1921, the warden, the game warden from Valentine, Valentine deposited 100,000 bass fish. And uh, so it, it really had very good fishing. Um, now the weather changed through the years and in 1940, they ended up uh, transferring uh, fish to Carter Lake. On a typical Sunday, you would go there for picnics. Um, and there was uh, one story about the Omaha Walking Club and they walked from Fort Calhoun to the Florence car line. And they stopped at the, at the lake for, um, um, for, for lunch. Now I do believe there is a walking club in Sarpy County too. So I think that was a popular thing to do back then. The largest picnic was for, a, for the Regina Corporation. And if you could picture 50 cars uh, leaving from 17th and Dodge that carried, they said 600 people and they went to the lake for a picnic. And at that, Lake, uh, it was one of the people there was the mayor, Mayor James Dahlman. Um, and I guess the commissioners got up on stage, they started singing songs and they, they even had vaudeville acts. Um, it became a summer resort and there was, uh, it was good for fishing and swimming and dancing. And then there were two youth camps uh, one was for St. Cecilia Cathedral, and then the other one was Morris Levy. So how did you get around in those days? Well, you drove a Dort truck. I had never heard of a Dort truck before. Um, it's the finest thing on four wheels. And uh, you can see on the left, uh, the Dort is uh, at the uh, entrance of Nathan's Lake. And Leonard wrote that occasionally it would make it to town without a catastrophe. So as I read different articles about the lake, I found many ads about uh, the lake. And the one on the left is one of these ads. And so here it says the lake uh, provided first class dancing. Uh, country cooking. You could rent a bungalow for a day or a week. You could play baseball there. Um, and for 50 cents, uh, the Nathans would pick you up and take you to the lake. And I, that's what you can see in the picture on the right. So there's Leah and Janet and Samuel in, the, in this dork truck and it costs 50 cents for a round trip. Uh, next, I want to show you some pictures of the youth camps. Now, the one at the top is the uh, St. Cecilia Cathedral camp. And uh, the gentleman was Father Mills Selby. He was the choir director. And the boys stayed out there for a couple weeks. Now, the picture at the bottom was Camp Morris Levy. And we can see uh, Leah 
she's cooking for the boys. You can see the tents. Um, and uh, it was written that this camp was one of the finest camps ever built. Uh, these tents were, had wooden floors. They were mosquito proof. They charged the families $7 for the, for the youth to come to the camp. And uh, as I dug into finding out names of people of these campers, it turns out that one of them was my uncle and another one was my uh, father-in-law. So here's another picture of Camp Morris Levy in 1925. And this camp was really the talk of the town. So what do you do at the camp? Well, this article talked about the boys at the camp don't care if August never comes. And uh, we can see they're at the dock over here on the left. Um, this boy here, he ended up uh, playing the violin there. These boys were having fun boxing each other. Um, and they had rowboat races where they would use tin pans as oars. I'm sure that was a lot of fun. Uh, they would raise, uh, they would rise at 630 in the morning, go to bed at 930 at night. Uh, and the evening campground was really a hit. Um, and they would sing songs and toast marshmallows and tell stories. Um, now a year later, uh, they had a camp for girls too. One thing that they did at the lake was they made a movie. This movie involved 100 children and they uh, met at the Jewish Community Center at 21st in Burke. Uh, the movie was sponsored by the World Herald and the kids would wear costumes made out of crepe paper. So if you could kind of imagine three treasure boats uh, or ships, pirate, pirate ships, um, and uh, it was just your typical story of looking for a treasure. Uh, but what a wonderful activity for the children, 100 children. So now, like I said, the weather changed. On the left, we can see what the original water line of the lake looked like. Um, and then in the 30s, there was a drought. So the middle, you can see Samuel, he's got this pump going and it's, it's pumping 340 gallons of water into the lake. He was, he was just trying to save the lake. In the picture on the right, you can see there are some, uh, the water had receded about three or four feet and some of the fish were actually dying, which was kind of sad. So here's a picture of Leah at the Omaha World Herald outside her office in 1936. Uh, here's her business card and you can see it says, Lenny Wise, the shopper. Remember that uh, picture earlier with all the ducks? Well, the lake drew the world champion duck caller. His name was Earl Dennison, and he was from Real Foot, Tennessee. And he was so good, he could do his duck calls, and it was kind of like you and I talking to people. Okay, uh, next I have a thank you letter that I wanna play. Uh, my son, Jeff reads this one. And this takes place, this soldier is stationed at Pearl Harbor. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming it is August of 1942. So it's just a few months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, oops, I got you. Happy the day of offensive year. Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, August 12th. My dear Mrs. Nathan, this is the type of evening when one sits back and looks at the sunset and dreams of friends and home. In this mood, I thought about you and the lovely and hectic days of Nathan's Lake. You made that stay so enjoyable out there and I cherish every moment of those boyhood recollections. It was a tough job. You handled it well. This is just a belated note of congratulations and of gratitude. 
It's memories of those days and people like you that make this business of war so easy to take. Everyone here is in its best of spirits. We're all anxiously waiting for the news from Solomon Islands and the other spots. In brief, we are all happy in the awareness that the time of biding our time has passed and that action and more offensive action will be the order of the day. With very affectionate regards to you, I remain Emmanuel. So I hope you can appreciate how uh, motivating that was to me when I read it because I, I think it's just really cool. Appreciate him for his service. So let's advance now to, to the year 2000 and uh, the US uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, did a survey. What, what kind of fish are in this lake? And uh, uh, there's an actual report of that. And part of the purpose of this survey was to see if it was a sustainable fish community for the Missouri River. Uh, and they concluded that it, it definitely could do that. Um, so here's an aerial picture of the lake today. Um, this, uh, you can say, where's the trees? There aren't any trees around there. Um, and this area is 650 acres. And it's uh, um, about twice what Samuel owned. Um, and uh, there's a project out there that is run by the Back to the River organization. Um, and they have made this project and it's called the Wetland Restoration. And on their website, it says that the lake was created in 2000 by diverting water from Deer Creek. Um, and it offers a place where fish from the Missouri can breed and spawn. Anyhow, I think it's a beautiful view of the lake. Now, if you go up to Humboldt Park and go a little bit further, there's a trail called the Missouri River Trail. And I'm standing by one of the two markers and it's called a lot of wet. And I'm pointing at the sentence that says projects like Nathan's Lake restoration show a modern awareness of the importance of the wetlands to river ecology. Anyhow, I think that's a really nice tribute to Nathan's Lake. So my story ends with a picture that uh, Richard Teets took of me. Uh, so here I am holding the family reunion picture at the lake. So I have reached my family a hundred years later. And just know that the Nathans and the Applebaums mark on this world and the preservation of their memory is wonderful. And may their memories be for a blessing. Uh, and I do want to take a minute just to acknowledge Ben. Ben was very helpful for me uh, in putting this together and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to uh, Sarpy County uh, Museum people. Um, and a big shout out to my Washington, new Washington family, the Doran family. Hi guys. Um, Rob Vosell, you were very helpful for me. Um, Julie and uh, in faith at the Washington County Museum. Uh, they're the ones that encourage me to dig up stories. Renee and Kathy at the Nebraska Jewish Historical Society. Walt who took me for that walk on to, to touch the land of the Jean-Pierre Cabernet. And Nancy with those infamous chocolate chip cookies and Richard took this picture. And my son Jeff did the readings and my son Andy went for a Sunday drive for me. And then I've got some contact information here because I'd love to hear your stories if you have anything to say about Nathan's Lake or the trading posts along the Missouri River. So Ben, I don't know if you want to take questions or, but uh, that concludes my presentation. Okay. Well, thanks, Ira. Yeah, um, this is, I've seen this several times and I have to say it's, it's a great story of kind of a, an everyman uh, who starts investigating their history and coming across some really neat things and connecting the dots here. Um, I guess one question that came in and one that uh, I, I 
kind of relates to what I just mentioned is how much of this narrative did you know going into all your research here? Um, I did not know uh, about uh, the lake until 2019. So I've kind of put this together in, in roughly in a little less than two, two years. Um, but I'm kicking myself because I didn't talk to my dad about it when he was alive. And, you know, I think we all kind of wish that we would spend a little more time with our family and talk to them. Because I, I would have lots of questions. Um, feel free, if anybody has questions and wants to ask Ira directly, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and chime in here if you have a question or want to add anything to the conversation here. Oh, I think I got no nope, other questions. <laughs> questions can sometimes be slow to come in on Zoom here. Uh, this was a, uh, I, I would like to pose a question to Mr. Nathan. Yes. Uh, hi, Mr. Nathan. My name is Dan. Did we lose you? We might have lost you there. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. I'm sorry about that. Thank you again for... Uh, the presentation was beautiful. Um, uh, what piqued my interest uh, was that my wife and I moved to the area, uh, Ponca Hills, about almost three years ago. And we uh, are pretty active. Um, we, we ride and uh, ride bikes a lot out that way and right along uh, the edge of what is that, um, uh, essentially it's like a conservation area now uh, that uh, housed uh, Nathan's Lake. And so that's really what caught my eye. Um, and it is beautiful out there. I know a friend of mine, um, uh, he runs the Nature Conservancy for Nebraska and I know he goes up there to spot birds quite a bit. So uh, it must really attract some wildlife to this day. Um, I just wanted to let you know, I, uh, my, my younger brother, Matt, uh, grew up uh, with your son, uh, uh, Andy, and I think they remain friends. So yes. that's the connection there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I really enjoyed your presentation. One question I have, um, do you have any idea what years the uh, uh, kids uh, camp was, was run at the yeah. lake? It was in the 1920s. Okay. 26, to, and I actually have a list of all the campers and all the staff that, that worked there. So if you're interested, I could show that with you. Okay, I thought it might be uh, uh, something a little later. So no, that probably predates anybody I would know. But uh, um, okay, thank you. I appreciate your sharing. Ben, could I answer the question in the chat? Yeah, so I'm, thank you for noticing that. Yeah, Robin asked in the chat, uh, what's your next step, Ira? Well, uh, I, I have reached out to, um, when I met with Back to the Future, or Back to the River, um, I wonder if we could just put a marker out there uh, that says Nathan's Lake. Uh, what a thrill it'd be for me. Um, and they encouraged me to reach out to DeSoto Bend and Boyer Shoot. And uh, this summer, they've asked me to do a presentation uh, at their visitor center. And I got my fingers crossed, but maybe we can do another marquee out there that would describe some of the history that I told here. Uh, and I think that would be especially nice. So it's, you know, it's amazing as you start digging into this, I feel like the story never ends. I mean, I'm just finding more interesting things. And then finally, I think you saw that uh, Karen's comment about uh, thanking Carol as well. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks Karen. Um, Eric, could I ask a question? I, I think you've just done such a beautiful job of showing your family history in a broader context of events that are going on in Nebraska. And a lot of times when people tell local Jewish history, they only tell local Jewish history and they don't show how the Jewish community is part of the larger fabric of the community. 
And I wanted to ask your thoughts on kind of those interactions as you were doing this research. Um, yeah, there was uh, definitely uh, a lot of, uh, there was a couple other articles about the Jewish families getting together out there. Um, they had one in the, uh, they came in from Des Moines, Iowa, and they kind of reached out there. Um, so I think it was just a place that, that they grew up. All, all the food that they served was kosher too. I mean, they, they, they were brought up that way and that's how they cooked. But the fact that our, the very first JCC summer camp was there, I, I think was kind of a way to bring everyone together. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, the, the timing is perfect in the 1920s with the advent of the automobile. Uh, and you have to think how stinky and smelly uh, and dirty Omaha was. And this was really an opportunity for folks to get out of the uh, rough and tumble city and uh, kind of reconnect with uh, the universe outside of, uh, of Omaha. Um, and so it's, it, it certainly is neat. Are there any other questions for Ira here? Okay, well, Ira, I wanna thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon virtually here, uh, sharing with us uh, your, your history here. I think, uh, I guess one last thought I have is that I'm not sure 20 years ago if you would have been able to connect all the dots here with uh, the advent of digitization and uh, you know history entities, whether it's local ones like us, the Sarpy County Museum or Douglas or Washington County Museums or History Nebraska, there's been a big push to make a lot of this stuff uh, more accessible. So um, I would encourage folks to you know, stop and visit their, their local historical entity and, and take a look uh, and see what's there. And you never know, it might just be related to you. Um, down at the museum, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to four. Um, ideally call down and uh, set up a visit. But if you just happen to show up, uh, we'd be glad to show you around. So uh, hopefully uh, if this is your first time for uh, your inter any interaction with the Sarpy County Museum, you'll check us out again, uh, follow us on Facebook, see what other programs we have, because uh, we do have pretty active uh, lineup. Uh, and I appreciate Ira once again for you being here today as well as everybody else. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna uh, leave. Ira, do you wanna take control if there's any other questions or uh, call thank it you, good? Ira, that was great. Well, thank you. I just love the opportunity because it's a, uh, it's a great story to tell. Great. Well, thanks. Good again. job. Good job, Ira. Thanks, Paul. <laughs>